Hi, Jim Connor here with Game Changers Silicon Valley. We're back at the RSA conference in San Francisco. I'm with Terry Ray of Imperva. Terry, you're here with a broad solution, both data and denial of service attacks. Let's take the data, which is a little bit different, and explain to uh, our audience uh, how you guys secure or provide security for data. All right. Thanks, Jim. When we think about data, it's really all about everything that you have in your environment that's most critical to the organization. So you think about your uh, structured data in your databases, regardless of what the database is, your file servers where you have data existing there. And from those perspectives, when you think about what it is we do today to secure all the rest of our environment, the purpose behind everything we do tends to be to protect the data. Yet what we ask organizations to do is to think about what are you doing actually at the data itself? And when you look at most organizations that aren't working with technologies like ours, the answer is they don't know who touches the data, when they touch it, how they touch it. In many cases, they don't know where their private data actually is. So our technology is designed to help organizations and provide organizations a solution to be able to pull the data in, see exactly what people are doing in the data, classify that data so you know where your private data is, and ultimately be able to put controls on that data to make certain that people are using the data appropriately, and when they use that data inappropriately, we can prevent it from happening. So some of the things that you and I chatted a little bit about, which I thought were unusual and unique, is that you can track the actual table, the table within a database, and you can act, track what's normally the uh, behavior or access patterns and when it spikes up what happens and you could just go to any of the data tables within a database and watch that activity. How, uh, how complicated is that setup? So the, the setup's not complicated at all. I think what, what, what becomes a challenge for organizations is understanding that their, their data is in thousands, if not tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of different places. And the intellectual property that we've built over the last 15 years gives us a unique ability to understand how to speak the various languages, whether it be CIFS, CIFS, NFS, or all the varying database languages. Unlike HTTP, which is the other side of our business, which is just one protocol, database languages all speak very different languages. So our capacity to be able to dig into those languages and understand what's happening in that database is exceptionally unique, which gives us a perspective that even if you were to pull the logs out of a database and put them into some other device that can do machine learning or analytics, it still doesn't speak the language, so it really doesn't make any sense at all for them to be able to extrapolate what's important and what's not, what's not important about that data. That's what's critical to us and our customers. You also said something that I thought was uh, essentially very interesting, that you maintain your own logs. You do not use the logs of the system, and you can explain why that matters. Yeah, absolutely. So when organizations, I, I would actually, I'd start where I'd say, you know, when, when you think about organizations themselves and the challenges they've had about auditing data, if you go to some of the websites that look at statistics on losing data, losing, most organizations who lose data, they wind up losing data and they say, we lost a million records, four million records, 80 million records, 100 million. It's interesting that they're always nice, big, round numbers, and the fact is, is they really don't know what they really lost, and that's the challenge of native audit logs. When you turn on the native logs of a system, it drastically impacts the system, so people just don't do it. And we think about that, our system was built so that we do not require the native audit logging. And that's a big, big factor for organizations that have traditionally seen any kind of data logging as a barrier due to performance reasons. Ours doesn't have that performance barrier because we don't require those native audit logs. Very good. I'm going to ask you another point, and um, it's human nature to do something after the horse has left the barn. Is that a big part of where your business comes from, or are people actually being more proactive? I would say it's a little bit of both. It is definitely definitely a little bit of the beginning as well. I have had customers tell me that for me to make this happen, I'm going to unfortunately have to get breached because we just can't move, move past to get the budget. Budget constraints are always an issue, I think, with, with security teams. And to be fair, sometimes it's an entire mindset as well. I've talked to CISOs in the past that half of them will tell me that they feel like data security is their responsibility. And interestingly, the other half of CISOs tell me that data security is the business unit or the DBA's responsibility. So it's this kind of marrying of two worlds of security and data ownership if you will, that have to come together, collaborate, and say, this is a problem and we have to solve it. And that usually once they do that, then they can actually get to the problem. Since you're so uh, integrated and experienced in this area, what happens in a corporation after the breach has occurred? Hmm. Well, it depends on how much information they really have, right? But I would say, for the customers we talk to post-breach, assuming they're not our customers already, typically they're looking to make sure that they have visibility. If this, actually I hear it often, if they, hear, if they have this problem again, they need to be able to see what happens. And I, I think the, the important thing here is to realize, when we look at a database tier, at a file tier, most organizations are very reluctant to ever block anything. Unlike a network firewall or any other kind of technology, 
the reluctance to be able to block is a big challenge that, that we have to, to get over. And after a post-breach, even after a breach, organizations still tend to be reluctant to actually turn on any level of enforcement in the back end. So I've asked people to say, look, why don't we just make a baseline policy that says, if you somebody takes more than, you define what the number is, more than a million records. It's a big number, but there are companies out there that wish they had only lost a million records. But if they can build a baseline in and just say, that's what I'm interested in, they can ultimately be able to secure the data. And these are things that we can do very, very easily and been able to do for years to, to be able to build policies that can restrict and minimize overall risk. Very good, last question I'll give you, uh, just a couple comments. Um, the denial of service attacks, have they gone up geometrically? Are they going on everywhere all the time and uh, sooner or later people get through or is there a leveling off of that effort? I don't see a leveling off at all. As a matter of fact, you know, denial of service attacks are very, very, very easy to execute. If you look at the, the ease and the limited cost of what it actually takes to execute a DDoS, you can go look up stress tester on, on, on Google or Baidu or wherever you want to look it up and find a stress tester. You'll find, ultimately you'll find one that says, we don't care who you are, you just tell us who you want us to stress. And they'll go stress that person for you. We call that a DDoS, they call it a stress test. But the reality is it costs about 28 to $48 for me to run a stress test against somebody. For somebody to prevent that, it can be significantly more expensive. So what we've done is we've, of course, built the other side of our business, which is web application security, and anti-DDoS is a large part of that. So one of the things we've been able to do is be able to prevent those kinds of DDoSs. But to answer your question, yes, it's been increasing exponentially because when we look at this, even our own capacity just a few years ago was about one terabyte. Today we're closer to four terabytes of total capacity across 35 data centers to be able to handle that kind of overall capacity needed to be able to prevent DDoS. A remarkable world we're in. So, uh, Terry, I want to thank you very much for your information, your insight, your time. You've been very uh, insightful, and I appreciate your uh, perspectives. Thank you, Jim.